Good evening and welcome to the Stained Glass Museum's third and final online webinar in our autumn series. Wherever you're joining from this evening, um, welcome. My name is Jasmine Allen, Director and Curator of the Stained Glass Museum, and we're delighted you could join us this evening. Um, hopefully distracting yourself from UK second lockdown if you're in the UK, and perhaps if you're joining us from overseas, you're maybe distracting yourself from the ongoing presidential election. Um, art is a great antidote to all of these things, so welcome. I would like to um, invite our speaker to share, uh, share her video now um, so you can see Mel House as I introduce her. Hello Mel, good evening. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us. You're very welcome. And for those of you on the online webinar, I'll formally introduce Mel, who is an award-winning artist, designer and maker, who has created a number of public art commissions. She studied at the Swansea School of Architectural Stained Glass in a really uh, key period for Swansea Glass, 1989 to 92, before setting up her own studio. And Mel works primarily in the mediums of glass and metal, and her portfolio embraces art that is integral to exterior and interior architecture and also to the sense of place. So Mel has a progressive, innovative and uh, intentionally utilises contemporary industrial techniques. Her style is, is progressive and innovative. She has received several awards for heritage and creative excellence receiving an award for excellence from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust in 2013 for her contemporary work with enamels. And over the course of 25 years now, Mel has completed a diverse range of commissions, including a 500 square meter art glass facade for retailer Jay Sainsbury's in Milton Keynes, the Huddleston Memorial window at Lansing College Chapel on the theme of apartheid, and that window was dedicated by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And most recently in 2019, she installed the illumination window at Durham Cathedral, which resides in the North Choir Isle alongside the Shrine of St. Cuthbert. So we're really excited to be hearing more about some of those works and, and probably some others too. And I will, without further ado, hand over to Mel now and uh, join you at the end for questions. So thank you, Mel. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's absolute pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, it was really lovely that Jasmine asked me to come and do a webinar, which I haven't done before. Um, and I think it's also nice to be able to talk to you about um, my work that actually is in the light of modernity, which is why I've called um, the webinar so. I'm a glass artist, I'm a designer and a maker, um, and I try to stay a maker despite scale. I'm going to talk to you this evening about stained glass work, but also some other things, because in the landscape of my career, there's been various other things that have come in and out, which I think are um, certainly an inspiration to me, and I feel linked to stained glass. I'll let you decide whether they do or whether they don't. So sometimes my approach is unconventional. Um, but I think that contemporary art means that whatever medium you work in, contemporary design keeps a medium relevant to our times and that's really very important. Okay, so um, in the light of modernity, that's where I've tried to stay throughout my career. And it all started here, as Jasmine was alluding to. Um, I was a graduate of Swansea Stained Glass Department the architectural stained glass department as it was called then and I graduated in 1992 um, and I always felt actually that it was a little bit of an accident that I came to study stained glass because I wanted to study fashion and textiles and I was desperate as a teenager to go to Brighton to study there um, and I also I really I really wanted to study a functional medium I mean hence my my thought that I might study fashion I did a foundation course at um, Portsmouth College of Art. And anyway, I didn't get into Brighton. So I got a list from the library and looked at what else I might go and study. 
And there's, there was this really, really very strange thing called architectural stained glass. And I thought, well, I have no idea what that is, but it sounds quite exciting. So I packed up my portfolio, got on the train, went along to Swansea. And when I walked through the door of the amazing building, and I know it still is an amazing building, I was just completely blown away by this marvelous, beautiful, functional medium um, that could be deeply meaningful and deeply emotional. And I thought to myself, you know, I think I must, I must study this. So I went and knocked on the door of the office and a very, very sweet John Edwards answered. And I said, I don't suppose I can have a place on your course, please. And um, he said, well, it might be possible, um, but we only have one place left. So three wonderful years followed that. And um, I won three awards as, as a student, which was really very encouraging whilst I was studying. And this was my first commission. It was a commission for a piece of work at the college. It was for a library on a staircase. And um, it was quite an important develop development for me because um, I had graduated and this was my first commission and I was really using the sum of what I had learnt on the three years of the course at the department. It's a study in light and materials and movement because it's on a staircase and already I was having ideas about using industrial um, techniques and also using traditional techniques together and also bringing um, what is outside into the piece by having some clear glass. When I graduated from Swansea, I opened my own studio. This was 1996. And with some money from the Prince's Youth Business Trust, I bought some equipment and off I went. This is a commission for Lansing College Chapel. And Lansing College, if you have ever seen it, if you're driving along the A27 on the coastal road in the UK, um, it's a huge imposing building, um, high up in the Downs. Um, it's one of the tallest churches in the UK and it's grade one listed. And the piece of work I was commissioned to make for um, Lansing College Chapel was the Huddleston Memorial window. And this was fitted in 2007. When I went up to the college to talk to them about making this window, designing and making this window, um, we went into the college library because they wanted to explain to me a bit about what Trevor Huddleston um, meant to the college. He was a pupil at the college and um, also he was key in the fight against apartheid in South Africa. And sitting, on the, um, sitting in the row of books on the shelves in the library was a tiny little book called Nought for Your Comfort, which I read cover to cover, um, was written by Trevor Huddleston about um, his fight um, to try and do something about apartheid. So my design shows a topsy-turvy world where some people have a lot and other people don't have anything at all. You can see actually it's a south facing window and again I've used the, the structure, the focus of the window is in the centre with a lot of clear glass around. This is um, the entrance to the chapel so it still lets a lot of light in. Minimal leading, a lot of acid etching, um, some stain and fairly minimal painting. And it was dedicated by Huddleston's friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It also reminds the pupils at the college and the students at the college that they too can change the world if they want to. Butchers Hall in the city of London commissioned a window for their entrance hall. Um, this was fitted in 2005, but it was a Quater Centenary window. That was the brief. And Quater Centenary means the celebration of 400 years. And they wanted to celebrate um, networking and sharing of knowledge within the Worshipful Company of Butchers. And you can see here in this slide, 
um, my original work started with drawing and so I was using hands joining together to represent people meeting to share knowledge. And on the right hand side of the slide you can see how the pencil drawing has been transposed into glass paint and antique glass. So this piece of work is semi-abstract, it's slightly representational because of the hands, but it also has around the outside of it a field of colour in etched glass. And this field of colour represents a shared meal at the table. And Butcher's Hall actually has just undergone um, the most amazing redevelopment. Um, it forms part of Bart Square. Um, development in Farringdon and it has had an absolute state-of-the-art makeover and this window still appears um, in its entrance hall. In 2012 I made this window for Winchester University College and the brief for this commission um, was to a chapel the Winton Chapel, um, which has a lot of male Victorian figures in them. So it was important to them to bring a sense of balance with some female figures. Here are of female saints in a sea of Victorian male figures. And um, these two cheeky ladies are... areas of the window are brushed and some of them are stained. Uh, an etched background represents a draped linen cloth and I used a very interesting resist developed in the dark room for the background of the these windows. This is a technique that I don't think has been used anywhere else but make the perplex design that you see. I don't see why um, saints in windows can't be very of today and a bit funky, which I think these two ladies are. And um, another nice thing about this window is that the models for the two saints are my sisters. In recent years, the Winton Chapel has um, won awards for its development, which are architectural. So now I'm going to show you a piece from 2008. This is Jay Sainsbury's at Central Milton Keynes. And this is a very different kind of a project to the stained glass projects that I was showing you. I still feel that this is very much stained glass. I don't know, you can have a look and maybe you feel it is, maybe you feel it isn't. Um, but this was a project for a new building. Um, Architects Q2 approached me um, a few years before 2008 and said that they were taking part in a design competition and they wanted glass art to be integral to their design and I wrote a journal about this piece of work as it developed and also as it was being made which I made into a book after the commission was installed um, and I just want to read you what I wrote then. It's very nice to record things as you go along because it, it sometimes um, takes you by surprise that the things that you were thinking. In an age where our buildings are replete with modern technologies and systems, art plays an important part in humanizing the built environment. Whether it forms a central concept for the aesthetic or forms just one component, Art can bring soul into spaces that we use as an advocate for the human touch. So I called this small book that I put together Vitreous Art because really I felt that that was what the work had become. Eleven huge canvases in a 500 square metre facade. And before we even came to the facade I actually designed for several locations around the building so it was really very nice that it ended up facing into the community. So the brief was also that the 
glass work must function in all lights and all times of the day and night, give the building identity uh, and create um, something that would be part of a, a retail flagship store, which we already knew when we were doing the designs, it was likely that it would be a Sainsbury store. So a form of glass work in toughened glass, um, which you need in buildings um, such as this, and a very expressive form of using um, decorative glass and toughened glass. So the largest canvas you can see on the right hand side is five meters by five meters, but you can see on the left hand side of this slide, the design that goes with it. So the design and its expansion into the glass itself. My approach to this project was always going to be very experimental. Um, it's intuitive, it's liberating, and importantly, it's interpretation, not reproduction. So it is not a straight copy of the designs. It is actually created as one would create a painting. So this piece of work really stretched the boundaries of painting on glass um, and enamel enameling um, and other techniques, which I shall show, in the, show you in a minute. But it was really a massive palette that just flowed. It was made in layers, so it was so the patterns and the forms could be built up. So there's vitreous enamels, silver stain, and it's plated with hand blown glass in some areas. An important expansion really from traditional techniques is this, every single panel in that facade, de the decorative panel in that facade, um, has a background of silver stain. Um, you'll know if you're listening and you're a glass artist that most people have packets of silver nitrate stain in the cupboard and traditionally it would be used by the thimble full. Well, this was used by the bucket full and applied with a spray gun. Very exciting um, and the most beautiful colour. I mean, you may also know that when this substance is applied, it looks like mud, like the bottom left hand slide there. And when it's fired, it looks the most beautiful gold tone. Very experimental, bottom right there. Um, in my designs, there were lots of um, complex patterns and there were some little noodly patterns as well. And in fact, it just seemed the right thing to do to use noodles to create the noodly patterns. In order to create the red in the design, um, pink enamel was used. Pink enamel layered on top of the silver stain, the gold together um, makes a much nicer red than red enamel, enamel in fact. So you can see the pink on the right hand side because these pieces here are not fired. Another link with tradition, an expansion of tradition, um, some big pieces of antique glass these have been etched. Um, acid etching is a process in reverse if you're not familiar with it. So where you put the resist, the acid doesn't touch. So where the resist is not, um, it will be eaten away by the acid. So here you see some um, pieces of large pieces of antique glass, flashed glass. So it's a layer of color or a layer of white and they're not cleaned up yet, but this is, the, um, this is the design in development. So these pieces would also have been layers on top of the other types of patterns that have already been created on the glass with either and stain and enamels. So just to go back, um, to the journal that I wrote while um, this piece was being made. In the true spirit of public art, this is a piece for those who rarely visit an art gallery, but who do go shopping. And it lives within a much used functional environment that makes it accessible to all 
within and without and at all hours of the day. And quite possibly at the moment, it's one of the few things that <laughs> will actually be open here. So you can actually go and have a look at it. It truly is a landmark. Um, you can't miss it. Um, and if you get the chance, do go and have a look and buy a pint of milk um, in the store and travel up and down the escalator and have a look at those great big panels because they're great to see close up as well as to see from a distance. But amazingly, these pieces are made in only two firings. There are only two firings on all of those pieces of glass. Um, and also every single panel is created in reverse because of the way that the glass had to be fitted. So quite some undertaking. So you may have noted that um, the last project was installed in 2008. Um, and that's poignant because um, as Sainsbury's was making a splash of colour as it was opening, um, the world around us was crashing and um, was fairly turbulent. And from my point of view, as an artist and a designer, I wanted to carry on developing. And the question was how to continue to develop um, my thoughts, mainly about working um, in vitreous enamels. So it was obvious what to do. I just needed to go and make a bath, um, which I did. <laughs> um, I got a, a, a scholarship from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust, um, which helped me on my way. But in fact, my, my re research and development was self-generated um, because there wasn't really anybody who could um, show me how to do what I wanted to do. So um, I just went for it really. This is the art bath. It was called many other things along the way, but art bath just stuck. Um, and uh, it's rather dear to me, this piece of work. It's vitreous enamels on um, cast iron. And um, working on metal is different to working on glass. Um, it, the enamels behave very differently, um, but it's also, um, again liberating um, and um, the colours are beautiful but the link between this and maybe the last piece I showed you is actually all of this is worked um, with a spray gun. This piece of work started for me the love of working on a curve um, and also the love of, of making vessels which I still do. So this piece is 2012 I'm sorry, this piece is 2009. In 2012, I showed this piece um, in a debate at the V&A called Crossing Boundaries. I went on to collaborate with a photographer called Ivan Hopkins. Um, so this is me and my bath on location. Um, and this is a really delightful record. Um, and fond memories of um, being on a photo shoot in the rain um, with my bath. And here's a commission um, in steel. This is St Cuthbert's Church in Copner, Portsmouth. Um, and I worked with this group for four or five years. And um, from that time came these two pieces of work, a font and a rare dos um, in steel and vitreous enamels. Um, and it makes quite an impact actually when you go into the church. It was a leap of faith um, from these, these beautiful people because um, they were choosing a new aesthetic um, for a Victorian building so a different kind of a surface and a different kind of appro approach and which is probably the reason partly it makes such an impact but they really wanted um, a font that spoke of baptism so this is a vortex of water rising from the church floor um, and it visually combines with the Reredos behind which um, speaks of St Cuthbert's journey um, in an abstract way. So a new aesthetic um, and an open-minded approach 
and a fresh approach to using materials. So here I am um, at Hourglass and in 2018 the photographer Julian Calder um, came to visit to take um, some portrait photos for a book um, that he was working on with writer Karen Bennett and um, he came through the door of the factory and he said oh my goodness you actually do this <laughs> um, so that was quite a good start to a photo shoot um, but the book uh, that the two of them published together is called A Celebration of British Craftsmanship. Um, and this is Julian's um, portrait that's in the book alongside um, a very, very nice um, text written by Karen Bennett, which, um, in which she describes really my journey over the last decade and um, the types of things I've been involved with. Um, so you can look out for that book. Um, it's available from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust and also um, Amazon. And in the book, you can also see the stories of other Quest scholars. So it's a very lovely record to have, um, a very nice portrait. And by the way, the pieces I'm making there are um, large toughened enamel panels. So there's a recent commission that um, really draws together many of my ideas about working with stained glass in particular. And this is Durham Cathedral. Um, it's a world UNESCO heritage site. And I was commissioned to design and make a window for the North Choir Isle. This is the illumination window and it res resides alongside the Shrine of St Cuthbert. In 2016, I received the most beautiful brief I think I have ever read and it was no normal brief. It was a collection of papers um, from Canon Rosalind Brown, Hugh Dixon, architect Chris Cotton, and the late historian Neil Moat. And their words described really the kind of window that they were looking for, for Durham Cathedral. So they were speaking of light and color and spirituality and beauty and wisdom. And the window was to be a memorial to a very special student called Sarah Pilkington. the very start I already had a, vis a vision of the window that I might make for Durham Cathedral. It was to be a celebration of young life, a vibrant life, a message of hope and I wanted to design a window where the glass contained no black as a symbol of life over death. So what I have made is full of movement it's organic, it's semi-abstract, which to me makes it accessible to all. Another important thing to note about this window is light control, because this window faces north, which people are often very, very surprised about because it has the feeling about it when you see it that the sun is always there, but of course it can't be because it faces north. And another important thing about designing and making this window was that a chapel called the Chapel of the Nine Altars, which um, comes out at a right angle to this, to this window, would, if you weren't careful, visually cut this window in half. So it was very important that the treatment and the type of glass um, could combat that and allow you to see a whole design, which this does. It took me two years to make this window.
I needed to follow through on my vision and I needed to follow through on the feelings and the thoughts that I had had um, when I first laid down my designs. And so I decided that I would um, start by making a full size cartoon, a full size color cartoon, um, which might be considered a little bit unusual today um, to actually make a one to one um, instead of just taking um, your scale design and blowing it up as it were. But I, I so much wanted to follow through on my vision. So I made a one to one color cartoon um, and I worked with my spray gun to make sure that the design flowed in the way I wanted it to flow um, and that I could work with a sense of place in my mind. And also by doing this, you are kind of making the work as you go along in your head as you are laying down the design on the cartoon. So it was a very useful thing to do. I really got to know the sense of scale. And um, also there was a local church in Chichester, a very, very big church with an amazing, um, amazing gallery, very high up. And they were kind enough to let me lay the cartoon out on the floor and go up to the gallery so I could look down on it um, to see what I had created from a distance. Along the way, I made lots of samples um, before I started making this window. Here is one of those samples, um, just so that I could try out um, the transitions within my designs. Um, I worked with antique glass and enamels, um, flash glass and a lot of etching. Um, anyway, this sample explores some of those transitions um, and some of the different weights that I wanted to use. The ground for the design was made by an awful lot of acid etching. Um, very free, very intuitive, obviously following the cartoon, but an interpretation of the cartoon. Quite gutsy groundwork um, and making continual reference you see on the right hand side to the cartoon behind. So really, really following through. Um, very important also um, to make sure that um, the marks that you're making um, will eventually, when all the other layers of the design are on there, create the effect that you want to create. So an awful lot of time was spent um, just putting the pieces up together and then taking them down again and then putting them up and then taking them down again. That was just essential. So following through again um, with sprayed work, um, here I am um, in the spray booth with a very nice portrait by photographer Jim Stevenson. Um, Jim is an architectural filmmaker and photographer and he made a record of um, the making of this commission throughout. So over the course of two years, Jim came in and out um, and you can watch his a film if you want um, on my website because it will give you um, a fuller insight into this project. Um, but I was again, again creating some quite complex um, shapes and quite complex patterns um, on the glass and things that make more sense actually when you see them at a distance than they do when they're very close to you, um, like the slide on the right. So I'm blessed that um, in part of my studio, I have a north facing window. So I, I could actually put the glass up in the window and um, check for scale and check for weight of paint. And again, you see the cartoon on the right hand side of this slide um, that um, continually checking to see whether I'm happy. Um, and it's quite interesting not to work with any black and rely only on tone of color, only on very dark green and very dark blue. Um, and the white in the design, of course, symbolic of life um, is obviously throughout. And that structure really carries the flow of the design from the bottom right up to the top of the window. And here are some of those panels at installation. Um, so, of course, 
they do look quite different when they're actually in place. And of course, that's something um, that's something you learn as, as a designer and maker that um, you have to carry a sense of place in your mind when you're making something. Um, because the thing that you're making doesn't belong to you, it belongs to that place. So here on the left is a slide taken during installation from the scaffolding. It was a very, very long way up, <laughs> um, but you got used to it. Um, and um, gosh, there was some incredible things to see right at the top of the cathedral there. So here is a slide that really shows more fully the transition of the colors throughout the window. And um, changing from one colour to another is an important um, effect in this window because it gives, you, it gives you a rising, soaring feeling, progressing upwards. It's a very contemporary work of art, um, but it really does fit very well in the place. People, I think, who normally don't have much of a passion for contemporary stained glass um have visited and told me actually they they really enjoyed looking at it so here is the quatrefoil which is the very highest tracery panel in the illumination window and i'm showing it to you just on its own because it's very nice when work is complete in itself as well as being part of a whole, a much, much bigger whole. And I think as well as trying to stay in the light of modernity, something I've often tried to create in my work is a completeness, a complete feel, a complete style, you know, something um, that is going to give every piece of work a very rounded identity, something which makes it instantly recognisable. It's a window that's very at home in the ancient architecture of the cathedral. It was only installed a year ago and thank goodness it was installed then um, and not this year. But the cathedral and Sarah Pilkington were always in my mind throughout the making of this window. Um, and um, I'm told that the students from the university like to go in to the cathedral when they're able to and go and sit by this window and you can light candles underneath it. And that's a very lovely thing to know. It's contemporary, but it's deeply meaningful um, and terribly passionate and very, very emotional. And I think that's exactly what stained glass should be. Um, those are the things that I felt in my heart the first time I entered the building in Swansea and that's what I've been wanting to create ever since really. So this is a symbol of hope and I think um, we all need that at the moment. It's not a sad memorial, it's very very alive. So go and have a look um, when you can and if you can over the next few months or few years or whenever you can but even as I'm sharing and looking at these images with you this evening, I'm feeling a real flutter of excitement because I absolutely love what I do. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to share it with you all. So thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mel. Um, I can see people saying wonderful work. Thank you. Um, for sharing it with us. It's so, so extraordinary to, and a great opportunity for us all to hear from artists actually speak about their work. Um, it makes such an extraordinary difference to, to how you kind of look at works and appreciate them. So thank you so much. Rounds of applause are all going round at home. Um, if you want to just stop sharing your presentation for a moment, Mel, um, we'll be able to see your face, I hope. Um, there we go. Fantastic. So we've got some questions that have already come in and please, if you've got more questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try and get through 
as many as you can. Um, rather selfishly, as the host, I'm going to kick off with one of my own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's it's the commission base. So all of those examples were, were mostly, apart from maybe the art bath, commissioned works. Yeah. As an artist, it, you, you've talked about working with, with place and architecture. Um, and that being important in your work. So is it nice for you to have a starting point, a brief that's come from somewhere else? How do you, how do you feel as an artist about, about those commissions and what do you like about them? Um, well, it's quite interesting because, because I make contemporary work and I think because um, mainly clients come to me because they know that often I'm a bit experimental and I push the boundaries. Um, on occasions, people give me a completely open brief. <laughs> And it's amazing, actually, which is why I kind of talked a little bit about the brief for Durham. It's amazing how um, when um, people uh, build a brief of sort of what they want something to look like, but it's open, um, that, that is perfect for me. Um, because then I can draw in um, lots and lots of um, layers of um, things I want to feel and things also that I want other people to see um, and then that starts a collective conversation about the piece of work that you're creating um, which I think actually then means that a project is something that everybody experiences not just you in making something for someone else does, does that answer the question yeah no, I think it does and um it perhaps leads on to another question from um, Suzanne, who has, has said, you've mentioned how long a single project can take, many years, mm. some of them. Can you focus on multiple projects at the same time? Or do you prefer to kind of be working on using your creative and technical energies on a single work at one time? Um, and again, whilst you're working on a piece, is it quite difficult to also respond to prospective clients and put in bids for work if you're working on an existing commission? Mm. It's very, um, that's a good question because it, it is very difficult because people will tell you sometimes things come like buses. <laughs> um, and um, sometimes you, you need to be able to re respond to several things at once. And um, uh, sometimes you can't, but you know, oft, often you can, or sometimes you, you, you need to. So you need to work out how you're going to do that. So that's, that's about, that's about planning, um, that's about being realistic about a schedule um, and um, multitasking. <laughs> it's about, yeah, and, and staying focused um, actually can be done. I mean, yeah, it, it can be done. But the, the reason I couldn't really do that with Durham because it was so intense, um, there, there wasn't, there just really wasn't space to look at many other things um, because I was completely full of that project. So um, the answer is absolutely yes, you can do it, um, but you can't always do it. It depends what kind of projects you have or have in, uh, have in the studio. Yeah. I'm sorry, Suzanne, that probably just totally doesn't answer all your questions. <laughs> um, you know, it's a balanced thing. Fantastic. Well, I think it's evident that, you know, some projects really require your whole self at that time to make them as good as, as they are at the end. So fantastic. Yeah. Um, a couple of people are asking, um, well, lots of people saying that they love your work. So I should say that because you can't see these comments, which I'm reading and I will make sure you get them, but people loving the strength and richness of your work, uh, thinking it's fabulous uh, and fascinating to see and hear about your work. Um, and a few people have asked, um, do you work with other studios? Um, and I don't know whether you want to uh, answer that question or, or, or feel like you can, but a few people have asked about that. Um, they're obviously massive scale works. So yeah. I guess, are, are there other studios in, involved sometimes? Well, you know, um, I showed you the Sainsbury's project and, you know, respect from, for, for Derek's who I work with there. Um, and for, for them letting me be that experimental, <laughs> um, which I, I would say is fairly unusual. 
Um, but I've made all my work in the UK for over a decade. Fab. Thank you. I think that answered those several questions, all from practitioners, of course. Yeah. Um, so Roger asks um, about black, because you talked about black, and I found this very interesting. In, in the Durham Quatrefoil, the, the very top piece, yeah. are, are those black lines lead lines? Um, and when you're talking about black, I wondered whether you were referring to lead lines and traditional glass okay. paint or one or the other or both. So maybe you can say a bit more about um, black. Okay, so um, let's be clearer on that. So in the Durham window, it has necessary, necessarily some very, very minimal leading. Um, it's a very, very ancient building. Um, it was the right thing to do to use those traditional materials, but the materials have not been used um, in a traditional way, really. Um, and the quatrefoil at the top, um, because it is the shape it is, although you could jet cut that shape if you wanted to um, out of a, a piece of glass, it, 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 wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a good idea because it, it um, um, would probably break in time. So um, that necessarily has some very few leads in it, but the actual glasswork and the design itself um, is in colour and white. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that absolutely does. Um, thank you. And I guess the use of lead as well as being structural is a nice little nod to some of the other windows in, in the building. So it, it just... Well, uh, yeah, it's that. And it's also the fact that, um, uh, especially, I mean, you know, um, World Heritage Site, you know, it does affect also what the uh, window looks like from the outside as well as the inside. Um, and, you know, that's also something that we were caring for in using hand-blown glass and lead. Yeah. Fab. Okay. Um... Jill has asked, this is a great question actually, what has been the public reaction to the beautiful Sainsbury's panels? And I guess because it's in a supermarket, you know, it's not your usual kind of glass art commission because a lot of people think of churches, although there's lots yeah. of public buildings. So do you know? Yeah, I, I, I have had people send me photographs of themselves buying pints of milk, standing on the escalator um, <laughs> in Sainsbury's. And because it's so accessible, people people can go and people can go and see it and go right up to it. I, from from inside, it's more difficult, although you can see it from the the escalator. But certainly from the outside, um, and um, I've noticed also as a, as a piece of contemporary art, it's been um, picked up by quite a lot of people. I mean, it it's huge. I mean, you can't you just can't miss it. Um, I mean, it has to be said, you know, why, why, why shouldn't supermarkets and other types of public buildings that we use all the time, ha why shouldn't they have amazing art in them? Why, sh why shouldn't it be there just because it's a supermarket, you know? Um, it's, it's not only for churches, it can be in many other places as well. So I think, I think that kind of proves the point that it can work. And it really, really does give the building the identity I mean, it's all. Fab. And it's, it is so large scale. I'm really glad you showed the whole facade because it really gives you a sense of that scale. Um, mm. work, working on such a large scale, is that something that you really relish? Or is it a little bit, sometimes you, you mentioned it can be a bit daunting, um, I think, uh, in a video that I, I watched actually the other day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know what? You don't, um, I'm mean, just thinking back to the Swansea days and that first commission, you don't get anywhere overnight. Mm. You, you sometimes get to um, having skills and experience over time. Um, and look, you can see the size of those panels. You know, you're, you're sometimes not doing, able to do these things on your own. Um, but um, I've got used to over years working at a very big scale. And if, if anything, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm more comfortable actually at working on bigger things than I am smaller things because I've got used to doing that. And I think my, my brain can make that leap between 
you know, things that necessarily to communicate to you a design have to be smaller. Although actually these days I'm doing a lot at one-to-one. -one. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I, I feel comfortable with making that leap. And I, I would say um, people should just go for it, really. <laughs> it's the only way you're going to learn to do it. And it's the only way you're going to appreciate um, what you design tiny um, scaled up, which is why sometimes you need to find a way. Um, you know, I know, know a lot of people use the computer and use CGI, etc. But, you know, that, that, that isn't the same as being able to see something at a distance that you might be designing, especially if it's an abstract piece it might look completely different big scale so these are things that you need to consider but it makes it exciting yeah for sure fantastic okay a couple of quick ones one is from me where, where is the art bath is it available <laughs> to see or is it available to hire <laughs> <laughs> on location outside somewhere <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you know what I still have it I just couldn't part with it I just couldn't part with it and and I will tell you also that I have the most fabulous bathroom at home but it doesn't have that bath in it aha so it is functioning it, it, it is a functioning bath it's a functioning bath amazing we've all just set our new home dreams a whole <laughs> level higher <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, another quick one which I just, just escaped me bear with me oh yeah someone just asked Carol wants you just to clarify um, the font and Reredos window that you showed where where was that again St Cuthbert but so, so that's another a, a sunk, um, St Cuthbert's in Portsmouth Portsmouth thank you um, that's answered that one um, Italia asks is there a piece that's given you the greatest joy to create and do you have a kind of favorite um technique or process as part of the is, is there like a favorite bit that you get excited about yeah. whether it's a technique or part of the process of making um huh. well i have a, a fondness for lots of different projects for different reasons um and um what do i like the best oh gosh um, I, I really love working with enamels and I also love working with, with, um, hydrofluoric acid, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, and, um, I actually, I actually like the slow processes as much as I like the, the fast, pro the fast processes. I mean, I think, um, I think the, the biggest problem sometimes is that, um, you can't see what you've created very quickly. And and all of us are used to having things very <laughs> quickly now in this world, but you know there are still processes like stained glass that are very slow to slow to to create. You know, I mean at least these days we have an iPhone and things, and we can take you know copious records as we go along to remind ourselves where we started and and where we got to. Um, but um, I will say when you work on steel, um, you can fire a, a piece of a piece in only a few minutes. So you can get that, you know. Large piece of glass that can be fairly quick as well. So there are certain processes that do help with that. So I don't know. I don't have any particular thing that I absolutely love. I think it's the combination of things together. Sometimes I find very exciting. Fantastic. Okay. Um, without going into any technical details, are you able to say whether it's th the same enamels that you actually use for metal gla and glass, or are They're they different? The They're not the same. Thank you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. Someone asked that. So um, I think we're going to finish up with a couple about what you're working on now, if you care to tell us. And also, is there a place or a type of space that you would like to make for in the future? Ooh, um, gosh, okay. So at the moment, I'm working on designs for new work. Um, I will at some point be working on a, on a vessel. 
so um, that that will be happening at some point. Um, sorry, what was the other question? And so, uh, is there a place or a space oh, yes. that you really like to? Okay, so um, I've made for lots of different types of building, and um, I would actually like to do more sculptural work because that I enjoy very much. Um, and I have been working on some internal spaces, which um, are turning out to be very interesting. So possibly I might do some more of that. But um, watch this space. Yeah, and I have put Mel's um, website in the Zoom webinar chat. So do you go and, and have a look? Um, there's some great pictures and information out there. And um, I'm sure you have a mailing list or something if people want to keep in, in touch. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mel. I, I think you've answered enough questions and I apologise that there are a few others that we haven't got round to, but that is just the nature of these things. There's always more to talk about and that's partly because Mel delivered such a fantastic um, presentation. So thank you so much for your time, Mel, um, from all of us. I know you can't see us, but uh, lots of people joined and really, really enjoyed this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Before you all go, I just wanted to um, notify you of an upcoming event that actually we have only announced today. Um, many of you have emailed us over the last uh, month or so to say how fantastic it is that we're doing these online events. Don't worry, we're not going to stop doing them anytime soon. And I'm really pleased to say that um, Rachel Mulligan, an, another artist, has uh, agreed to talk to us about her narrative work in stained glass, including a series inspired by uh, COVID and lockdown, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. Uh, that's on Wednesday, the 9th of December. So hopefully it will be after the UK lockdown. Um, tickets are now available, so do go and have a look. But it's something to look forward to, which we certainly needed at the museum, and, and hope that you can put it in your diaries. Good news if you're friends of the museum, because we're making that one free for friends. And um, those of you who aren't friends will need to just buy a ticket. Um, which leads me on to the, the final slide, uh, just to remind you all, if you're not uh, friends of the Stained Glass Museum, it is a fantastic way of supporting the museum, um, coming to events like this and hearing about them, as well as uh, supporting our national collection of stained glass. We are closed at the moment for at least four weeks, but we will be keeping in touch with all of you online. So if you um, have social media, please do follow our accounts. And thank you again for joining us this evening, everyone, um, wherever you are. I hope you stay uh, well. And um, thank you, Mel, very much again for, for joining us this evening. Goodbye. <laughs>